morning, everyone. Thank you for your time. I'm really excited for this session. I have an addiction to telecom, and I'm just really excited to hear your opinion about the evolution of digital transformation and what is to be expected. So Mark, I'm going to start with you. With 23 experience of telco experience, it's safe to say that you've been doing this for quite a while. And how has digital transformation has changed the telcos, in your opinion? Well, it's, uh, how has it changed? Well, first of all, I haven't been doing it for that long, only about uh, 35 years. <laughs> so it's not uh, that well. I would say that uh, things change everywhere. Yeah. They change at the consumer landscape. They change in the domestic landscape, the international landscape, for enterprises and for wholesale service providers. I'd say that over the last uh, 10 to 12 years, we've experienced the impact of cloud at the enterprise level. And of course, in the last 15 years, the impact of the smartphone from the consumer level. Both of those infrastructures of, or devices have, has impacted everyone. And now last November, a year ago, we got hit globally with a, a much larger awareness around AI and the impacts that that will have. And there's more to come that will evolve. And what's interesting is, is that service providers have stayed the course and continuously changed their operating model in order to deal with the new technologies that have evolved from any place in the world. The only other item that I would say in terms of change is that 30 years ago or, or more when I came into the business, the world was headed towards a ubiquitous globalized environment. And today we have the impact of technology that's impacting globalization, but we see that Geopolitically, the world is, is looking at focusing more on privacy, on security, in some instances both, and so there's more jurisdictional awareness than used to exist 20 years ago when we were building out technology through globalization. So those are the, the, the main issues, I would say. Number one is technology impact for consumers and for enterprises, and second, geopolitical perspectives on how to manage those technological evolutions. God, that's great. You're absolutely right. Um, so, Rashid, with your combined experience in working in telco and then you moved to Infrarex, what are the outcomes of digital strategies and plans executed? Can you give us an overview and an example of those strategies? Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of uh, this summit to invite us uh, being part of this panel. Um, one of the outcomes of Dubai Electricity and Water Authority strategy was to uh, insert digital diwa. If you know, uh, there was a program called Dubai 10X under Dubai Government Entity Accelerator. The uh, objective of this program was to put Dubai 10 years ahead of other cities. And the outcome of the um, strategy of diwa under this program was uh, digital diwa. Um, that inception created um, an approach where we started to look into the current infrastructure and assets available in DIWA, try to produce efficiency when it comes to the operating model under the mothership company, but at the same time, create new subsidiaries that we were able through them to offer services to other government and private entities in Dubai. And what is the reason behind that? We saw that there would be a quite uh, impactful uh, uh, reasons that will uh, disrupt the utility business as it happened to the telecom market five years or ten years back when the OTT started to interrupt the telecom business. The same thing happened to be right now in the utility business, especially if you look at the new renewable uh, sources, the new disruption model of delivering the energy and water services before it used to be centralized approach. Now everybody will be able to sell back to the grid all of this disruption required the utility to look into different sources, how they will be able to recover the loss of revenues that will be produced by such disruption. So therefore, that digital transformation agenda and strategy that we made under Digital Diwa was the main reason behind uh, the ability to look into the current assets and infrastructure, build a roadmap into um, uh, utilizing those technologies to produce efficiency internally, and in the same time, offer it as a service for the other customers within the region of reach that we are able to serve them with. So it's always a win-win-win, as you said. Definitely. Always a win-win-win. Lovely. 
Um, Tamer, when I talked to you, you told me like a very interesting information, which still is absolutely mesmerizing. I want to know more about it later. Um, any, any EC has 125 years in innovation and technology. So my question for you first is going to be, um, how do we log digital transformation in other industry verticals and connect the dots? And how we can just have that utilized and continue innovating and continue um, this ride of digital transformation. Yeah, thank you, Mariam. I think maybe what you said that the 125 years of accumulated experience is, is playing a role and also the diversity of, uh, of the company. So we are not a telco company, we are not a public sector company. Big diversity, long accumulated experience. So we look to the digital uh, transformation from different angles. And we start from uh, like the digital economy itself. How do we contribute to the economy? And we need to ask ourselves, why are we doing digital transformation? It's not, uh, it's not only technology part. It's uh, do we have every fundamental required for the transformation? Did we consider the mindsets? Did we consider the organizational part? Uh, how that will be contributed to every industry we are dealing with. So how that will help the health sector, the, the financial sector, the whole economy. So how that will help the business, how that will achieve the organization or the, 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 the shareholder expectation and what they expect from this transformation. So maybe one of the, 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 the big value of NEC is the diversity. So, uh, so we, 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 we came across many programs uh, of course, not every, not every one of them is, is very successful as we wish, but we learn from everyone, and we have this kind of accumulated experience to, to connect the dots and to understand what every industry are expecting from this uh, digital transformation. So while, uh, while we are delivering digital transformation for, uh, for the telco itself, so we also understand the business aspects. We, we understand what business officers are expecting. So. Uh, what solution he will sell to every segment in the market, and how can we enable him? So uh, I, I think those kind of uh, factors are uh, enabling us to be uh, successful in, in, in the digital transformation journey. Inshallah for 250 years more. <laughs> uh, but like just to add on that, um, can you just give us an example of where you've actively connected those dots between industries using digital transformation. Sure, so, so actually maybe since we are in, in, in more into telco focus uh, uh, events, so uh, uh, Netcracker is, 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 is a NEC telco arm and uh, they are the most successful uh, player in, in telco digital transformation. In this part of the world, in the Middle East, uh, I, I don't want to name, but almost every uh, tier one uh, surface telco surface provider are relying in Netcracker and in, in, in digital transformation. The whole journey, not only the technology part, so the business enablement, the even the the, the like the part of uh, building the uh, DevOps capability, enabling those kind of uh, surface provider for continuous development, continuous operation, how to run it for uh, uh, for for a sustainable uh, period, not just deliver it, but also how to operate it, how to run it, the go-to-market part, so in every, in, in, uh, in every aspect. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Mohammed, I, I, I don't know if I have a bone to pick with you, but as mobile network providers, they are very, very vital, um, basically, um, uh, for mobile t operators uh, to provide the best and premium services to their customers, whether it is prepaid, postpaid, B2B, billing, and now digital. So how can mobile network prov uh, uh, providers assist in making sure that telco operators have the optimum digital services, uh, service experience and continuity? Sure. So first of all, let me say that uh, all mobile service providers play a pivotal role in supporting mobile operators in the digitalization journey. So, of course, with the COP28 ongoing, I need to start by sustainability. And like our CEO of Nokia says, there is no green without digital. So in order to address the sustainability aspect, we need to address the digitalization aspect. And of course, we have it embedded in our technology, in our solution, in our products, which is in, we have AI and machine learning embedded in it to achieve two things. 
first energy efficiency to address the sustainability, but also to address the flexibility and traffic agility, which is becoming one of the most important areas for operators. The second thing I would like to highlight is the monetization of the technology, of course. So we have now the 5G, we have the new technology coming, and it creates different monetization segments around digitalization. The first one was the IoT, and of course the barrier there was the cost. Cost was the highest barrier for all IoT's element to become more and more utilized in our life. And now, actually as we speak, we're trialing in UAE a new technology, which is the rat cap, which is exactly addressing the cost of IoT in order to bring the barrier down and make it more and more efficient. Second thing, of course, in the industry 4.0, and of course, DIWA being part of it, which is a private LTE, and how you can support factories, ports, electricity companies, even in more aspects. Maybe the third thing we need to focus on is the Nokia Bell Labs, because, of course, the digitalization is a journey. It's not only about operation. Of course, we do have digital design and digital operation to support our customers, but, of course, it's a full mindset change tools, processes, people. And this is where our Bell Labs helps a lot uh, to, to support uh, operators to have this journey. Last but not least is, of course, the, the partnership ecosystem, which can, because Nokia is not only promoting Nokia solutions, but the whole partnership ecosystem, like the hyperscaler, like other partners, and together they go as a full end-to-end -to -end solution. And here we bring an ecosystem this holistic ecosystem of collaboration and innovation. And this is exactly an ecosystem which embraces digitalization. A thousand percent, but uh, as an ex-telco, and I'm sure maybe uh, Isam would also agree, um, don't you think, do, or is it some sort of strategy that mobile network providers are doing where they make sure that whatever network service they're providing they make sure it is agile, it is open for customization and everything. So, because we have seen in the past where it is kind of a roadblock whenever you want to do certain things, whether it's yeah. billing or creating a service, or and we get to see that kind of difference in the market across the region. We have seen places with monopolies that I'm not happy about, and then you have seen places where they are trying different network operate, uh, uh, providers as well, just to balance or the services or making sure that they each area they can cater to. So what's your thoughts about that? Let me tell you more about it. So first of all, what mobile operators would like to have? They would like to have a better customer experience to their consumers. They would like to have agility in providing the service to their consumers. They would like to have agility in providing the right traffic based on the need. They would like to have a, a digitalized way of operation in order to make it more uh, AI-driven in order to support better their customers. They would like to have energy-efficient solution, and they would like to monetize whatever they invest in. Because you have so many new technology coming, Absolutely. and it's all about how they monetize it, have more revenue on it, and at the same time serve the consumer better, and create new segments, which is around the verticals, which is becoming more and more important in our industries. And of course, the sustainability point which I mentioned. And all that can be managed by the four things I mentioned. First, the embedded AI and machine learning in the product and solution. Second, the digital design and digital operation. Third, working on the new segment based on the new technology, like the red cab I mentioned, because it will bring the whole industry ecosystem to a lower cost and of course the sustainability aspect. So this is exactly what they have in their mind and they would like to do. That's excellent to hear. Um, Dr. Bilal, standardizing policies is absolutely vital and important. So how can we leverage our new technologies for a safe digital experience and making sure that it is actually a seamless experience, making sure that it is secure and people feel safe using it? Excellent question. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, the uh, ITU has two strategic priorities that were set by our uh, members, the 193 member states, uh, to be um, universal connectivity and sustainable digital transformation. Universal connectivity because 2.3 billion people are still unconnected and we cannot talk about digital transformation without getting them connected first. And then the second uh, strategic priority is sustainable digital transformation. 
uh, and that really came just last year as a strategic priority after COVID. And uh, I joined my colleague earlier that said, uh, COVID has really put a um, spotlight on the importance of digitization. Um, when we talk about the digital transformation, uh, we are looking at all the sectors uh, from finance, where we started our journey in 2014 with the Gates Foundation and, and the World Bank. And at that time, we were looking at 2.1 billion adults without a bank account. Two thirds have a mobile phone. So it was very easy to focus on the mobile phone as an enabler of digital transformation to include people in the economy. Because if you're not banked, you cannot get a microcredit, you cannot transact. Um, and so that was an important first step. And the technology building blocks that were necessary is first the identity, the digital identity, to be able to uniquely identify the customer. And then the next one is to secure the transaction uh, and the consent uh, of the user. And these three building blocks provide the trust in transacting your money on the, uh, on the network. Um, and from there, we started seeing how um, diverse countries are in, uh, in adoption of technology, in skill set, uh, in the ability to really use the literacy, uh, the digital literacy to be able to use uh, those uh, services. And the third aspect is, of course, the regulatory environment. And this is true for all the digital transformation challenges or journeys that we have, um, because telco in the traditionally has had its telecom regulator that just looks at the pipelines and the connectivity and the relationship with the customer for a phone, voice, or SMS service. Uh, when we talk about, let's take the example of mobile money. The money in a country is regulated by the central bank. The telco is regulated by the telco regulator. If we don't have an enabling environment where the telco, the uh, telecom uh, regulator, and the central bank get together, and put in, a, in place a possibility for a network operator to become a bank, and a bank to become a network operator, or to create new entities, uh, all the technology that we have cannot be used in the country. And that's where ITU could play, uh, and has been playing an important role in enabling the regulatory environment and bringing the ministries of ICT with the others. And I say the others because the same example I gave, gave for mobile money um, holds for digital health. We need to get the Ministry of Health talking with the digital ministry <coughs> to enable electronic records, uh, medical records, uh, etc. Uh, another area where uh, it's transforming rapidly is um, the automotive sector. Uh, when you buy a new car today, there are at least two SIM cards. One that the um, car manufacturer uses to download software, to monitor the, um, you know, the operation of the car and another that could be used for emergency calls, infotainment, and so on. When you say two SIM cards, there are two numbers, identifiers, attributed by the ITU, either indirectly through the member state, so you have a country code and a telephone number, or directly by the ITU. So the TSB director, I think I saw Onoe-san in the back, he's the international regulator when it comes to shared codes. For example, Tata in India gets a lot of codes directly from ITU to be put in the cars, and they don't have a country code, they actually have an international code. We call it the global SIM. This is another building block of the digital transformation in the automotive sector to have those cars connected to act as a device in the network. And now with the um, autonomous driving, all the new cars, if you get a Tesla or BYD or any of the EV cars and so on, they have cameras. And there is an amazing source of data that can be used to train algorithms on autonomous driving and assisted driving, but could also use, be used for road safety. Now, just before coming to here, I was in Dammam, Saudi Arabia, where they had their sixth uh, conference on AI for road safety. Uh, they had all the police and all the um, neighboring countries participating, and they wanted to hear from us, the ITU, with other, uh, another UN partner, which is the UNECE, that regulates the automotive sector, on how um, collectively, we can bring AI to increase road safety. And of course, this goes through the operator network, the connected cars, whether it's V2V, V2X, or regular connectivity, has to go through the, the operator's network. So all of these are examples of digital transformation, where you need the connectivity, it could be narrowband or broadband, <coughs> when you need the identity management, 
either of the person or of the device, like the car in this case. Um, and then you need uh, the trusted, secure communication. Uh, if we have those building blocks in place, of course, you have to have the data center to store the data and so on, then we can move into more advanced solutions using AI, machine learning, and so on. I've seen this example on the cars with General Motors that they have been trying to do in 2018, 2019. Um, and uh, without naming the telco operator I was working in, we were working with them on this. But the thing that we were fearing the most when it comes to these kind of digital technologies is people and how they accept that kind of information being shared back to the, to, uh, um, the car manufacturer or the, the mother company. They think they are being you know, watched or something like that, even though it is something for their safety. Um, it's something that we could work with the Ministry of uh, uh, Police Department, uh, Interior Affairs, uh, or whatever it's called. Um, just to ensure, as you said, road safety, if someone is in trouble, if someone got lost in the middle of the desert, like the amount of women who wants to go to the desert and they're just lost, for example, they can just hit that button and it could actually save them. But um, instead of being wandered around, but people don't feel comfortable about sharing that kind of information. So how can we change that perception with people when it comes to sending back data? This is where the consent comes in. Yes. Uh, there is a concept of an e-locker of your own digital assets, your identity, your passport, um, your certificate for e-signatures and so on. Um, and, and in many of the e-government projects that the ITU is involved in, uh, there, is, there are several models of how you manage the identity and the digital assets. One uh, very popular model now is called the, uh, the e-locker, where you as a citizen put all of your digital assets in the locker, and then you can give consent to the various users or uh, agencies that need some of your documents. The same way that you would carry your passport, your ID on you, your credit card, but instead of carrying them physically and then going to the post office and saying, you know, I am Bilal Jamusi, here is my ID, um, you get a message on your phone to, uh, to see if there is consent for you to share your ID with another agency, and then you can transact digitally. Uh, so I think consent is an important element of protecting your data, your private data, and giving you the final say whether you're going to share it or not. Absolutely. I think uh, um, back in Kuwait, they have implemented something like that during COVID. You know, COVID made us all go digital. Um, but uh, transactions and getting paperwork done, honestly, being on the phone is so much easier by having this. And I think the UAE have something like that as well. So uh, you're absolutely right uh, on this one. So now, Isam, what's your opinion on the importance of digital inclusions in telco for a successful digital transformation, especially in key sectors? So, and you know, for me, I'm a B2B person. You know, B2B is the best of the best of the best. I love B2B. So we were just talking about different sectors uh, in the market and how can we just make sure we, we have that uh, done correctly and fairly? Absolutely. I think the, the, the key part of, of any type of engagement across the sectors, and you mentioned healthcare and we talked about financial services. Um, and you, you hear the term a lot around co-creation. Um, but if you step back in, in kind of like history in, in the early 2000s, we talked about you know, being more customer focused and what happened then? New channels were open, contact centers, um, web access to, to, to organizations for the customer. And then kind of like evolved a little bit where we said, okay, let's make it customer centric. That meant changing the operating model, putting the customer in the center of that operating model. It still wasn't finished. So what we're seeing now, we talk about co-creation, is customer embedded teams. Um, and I've seen this work very effectively in healthcare where you know, a, a team has been assembled. So in the traditional consulting approach, you, you set up your team, you set up the, the customer team. The new way of doing it is, is one team, one customer embedded team. And that includes physicians, that includes you know, patients where necessary as well. And what that brings is, is insights that the team would never have if they're working together because you're embedding that, that industry expertise into the solution, into the thinking, into the process. And that's, that's really where you know, we're seeing things much more successful. And I think in the panel before, um, you know, they were talking about UAE Pass. And UAE Pass for me is, is a fantastic application. Um, and if you look at what you know, the federal government, Dubai government did with that, was to give you the right experience. I mean, I would even put it up there against 
Google, right, with single sign-on. All your documents are there. You can you QR code them. So this is around providing the right experience. And the way to do that is to have the right resources to give you, give you insights. Um, and, and the key point, I think you mentioned it beautifully earlier, is around ecosystems. And this is where, for me, the hyperscalers have, have got it right. So they don't just come to you with a, with a cloud platform. They come to you with a cloud platform and an ecosystem. And I think where the telcos are well placed is, is around trust. So where telcos are providing services to customers, they have that trust. They have that trust. And they're in that perfect position to, to orchestrate across all the different capabilities out there. And that's the kind of like, people call it the secret source, but that's how you innovate, yeah? And we were talking earlier, and I'm sure that you know, if we had a problem to solve on this panel, we have some very bright people here. Absolutely. But if we extended it to the rest of the audience, we'd come out with a much better solution. And that's where, where the ecosystems add the, the, the secret source, if you like. So from a, from a B2B perspective, the, you know, the, the telcos are very well positioned to provide these services and bring together the different capabilities as a trusted orchestrator. And I think that's, that's the key part, and that's what certainly within do something that we're very passionate about doing. So for me, the best segment I've worked with, to be honest, out of the four is the Sohos. For one reason, they are actually the most innovative with their solutions. So what, how, what can you give us as an example that you have seen some sort of innovation where they have actually asked for a proper digital uh, uh, service and you were like, wow, this is great. How can we productize this? Yeah. So, so for, for me, the Soho, the, the, the small office, uh, is, is an interesting one because these are the ones that grow into SMEs and then large enterprise. Um, so typically for those, they, they want accelerators to allow them to innovate. So the digital ones, the digital startups in that segment, um, they're the ones that, you know, certainly from a telco perspective, we want to capture, capture early, just like I can see some of our friends from the hyperscalers want to. So to provide them with some support, with, with, with all the different tools, and, and capabilities that allow them to launch fast. So you, they, they want the simple CRMs. They want the simple ERPs. They want to be able to you know, spin up services very easily. They want to focus more on, on SaaS solutions. Yeah, they want it, the full digital experience. You know? So the, the, that particular segment, we want to target yeah. to them you know, SaaS offerings or, or services that can help them move at the pace that they need to. Absolutely. So Mark, back to you. So I, I think I've been out of telco for a while, but like, you know, I try to keep up when I can. So what do you think 6G would be able to do? So it's coming close, like five years is gonna creep us, you know, coming, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> we won't feel it. But like with 6G coming, like it's just had so much huge potential uh, in bringing digital transformation, making it bigger and louder. So uh, what's, what's your thoughts about it? What like do you think? Uh we started hearing about 6G last year at, at MWC, coupled with the need for mobile operators to focus more on deployment of 5G because they hadn't really done that yet. <laughs> and uh, I think 6G is, is at the moment vendor driven and less uh, <laughs> government driven. And I think that the operators, particularly the mobile operators are today looking at what is the underlying capability of 5G and they've discovered that it's enterprise. Yeah. And most mobile operators today worldwide are generally organized to the consumer business more than they're organized to an enterprise business. Why? Because the consumer business is fairly straightforward. It's driven by the end device and the applications that are on top of it. So then let's, let's break that down a little bit. We have devices, applications, physical infrastructure, and now for the enterprise, the concept of cloud. And most importantly, all of the different applications. When you're a consumer, you see all of your applications on either the iPhone, uh, on the Apple Store, or on the, uh, on Google, the Google Play, Play Shop. And now, let's, let's uh, remember also in China with Huawei, introducing ad additional capabilities and, and additional environments in order to draw down the applications. But what about the enterprise? And this is complicated. Most enterprises today are generating their workflow over a cloud in some way, shape, or form, and I agree with the colleague from Do that said that the cloud has it right, but let's hold on to that for a moment. Most enterprises are generating their requirements over at least 30 and on average more than 50 different applications for an enterprise. So how do you do the connectivity, the devices, the applications, the SaaS, 
and all of those elements in some sort of ubiquitous fashion. And the clouds might have many things right, but one thing they don't do yet very well, and that's interoperate with one another. And so an enterprise that wants to be leveraging value from one cloud with another cloud, they'll need a platform in order to do that. I think that where we have to go first is to create ubiquity of platforms and networks, and I was very excited to hear the colleague from the ITU talk about the requirements there, in order to assure that enterprises as users can be able to drive the value of 5G to the ultimate demand, which is all of this cloud requirement infrastructure, which is a facilitator to AI and ultimately to quantum compute, which we're going to see going forward. Once you get that ubiquity and the understanding that enterprises will be working with multiple applications in multiple clouds, and you provide the platforms for that, together with device management, because bear in mind what the colleague from ITU was referencing, all of those cars with ITU SIM cards, yeah. that's all going over the public internet. Well, that's not healthy, is it? Particularly when you're dealing with privacy and security. So how do you generate a SIM card endpoint that appears as a private instance on a cloud. Mm -hmm. That's going to be critical to do. If, you're, if you want to extract all of that data from a vehicle, and we talked about privacy and, and consent, and some governments would actually say that it's the reverse. You have to de depends which government you, you live <laughs> in. So you, you have to look at how that availability becomes through and how that availability is managed. And I think that before we get to 6G, we have to organize all of this information well as 5G gets driven. I think we're at the very early stages of 5G enterprise deployment. There's no doubt consumers have enjoyed it in terms of the bandwidth availability, but we still haven't gotten to, for instance, yeah. network slicing over no. multiple networks. How do you roam with a network slice? It yeah. doesn't exist. You're hearing a lot of instances about a 5G hospital here and a 5G uh, construction and, and inventory and logistics. There's a lot happening in logistics and, and shipping but very little happening in terms of network slicing roaming. So I think that, that those pieces really need to get consumed. And as always, an application will drive the demand for infrastructure. And I think we'll see that the advent of AI, which at the moment is more of a broadcast <laughs> structure, long, large language models feeding specific demand sets, when it becomes ubiquitous and user-to-user and -user large language models for a variety of reasons, then I think you'll start to see a demand for, for 6G that will start to evolve. But of course, the vendors will try and sell as early as they can, and uh, I applaud them in their efforts in that regard. Get your 6G router, yeah, yeah. you know, for 100 dirhams. <laughs> uh, but like speaking of that, to be honest, you're absolutely right. Like, just a simple example, uh, my, my daughter goes to school, and there are six different applications that I have to deal with from the same school. And, and it's just absolutely beyond me why but, this is not in one platform. Uh, and those are probably they, consumer applications. Yes, I, and, I am, I'm not and, sure, but yeah. So at the enterprise, imagine at the enterprise level that you're going to have ERP, CRM, any type of customer service management, yeah. any type of trouble ticketing management, all the, those are the three big ones that you're going to be looking at. But then there's all the other different pieces, whether it's inventory management, logistics management, operations management, the volume of applications, and some will be on-prem, some will be cloud, some will be GCP-based, some will be AWS-based. How do you measure and map, and how do you create backups on that? Yeah. And so I, I think that, that we still have a long way to go with huge, one thing is certain, change is constant, and the demand for data growth yeah. is also constant. And then the issue becomes the pace, and how that's integrated and managed, and how we as different types of members of the ecosystem interoperate with one another as ubiquitously as possible. You're right. Um, Rashid, when you look also at 6G, so we have seen what 5G has done in the government sector or the public sector. With 6G, it's also saying that it's going to highly benefit the public sector more than it would be the private sector. So what's your opinion on that? And what do you see coming, and, or, and how is it planning for these things? Because, you know, again, five years is, is coming tomorrow. You know, we, we won't feel it. It's just going to be so fast. Definitely. But I would like to echo Mark in terms of first, we have a lot to do to utilize the capability of 5G. And I think the technology provider did not spare an effort to make it happen. 
uh, what we are missing, to be honest, from uh, uh, ecosystem point of view is the right business model. And we are uh, very proud that uh, as a utility, we created the first uh, 5G standalone POC with Do in Mohammed bin Rashid Solar Park to uh, trial uh, running AI-based cameras over our overhead line uh, uh, for electricity, which uh, produce efficiency in terms of um, traditional patrolling to inspect the um, overhead lines from uh, four visits a day uh, to real time with efficiency of more than uh, 20% and a uh, big amount of saving when it comes to dollar sign. So I believe such models, when it comes to enabling the 5G to be utilized in efficiency use, case, use cases and creating the right selling SIM cards anymore. This is you need to look at it as a 10 key solution where you are providing infrastructure as a service. Building on that, Mariam, uh, regarding the um, readiness of uh, 6G, I think um, based on the discussion we saw today, the convergence of industries is uh, crucial. When you talk about 6G, we are talking about uh, moving from micro cell deployment to even nano cell deployment. Ask yourself, where are the towers that you will deploy such infrastructure? Where are the uh, energy that will be required to enable such infrastructure? So when we talk about convergence, we took um, um, kind of a vision inside the Digital D1, especially Infrax as an infrastructure company under a utility. We built a concept of um, all-in-one substation, where you know the electricity and the utility business have a mass diverse and spread infrastructure across the city. Those infrastructure will be the best fit for the future 5.5 and 6G deployment, where instead of acquiring sites, uh, trying to provision power, uh, finding a place for each computing application, the future electricity substation will be a one-stop shop for all the service provider, the utility provider, to host their towers, to backhaul their traffic, to produce edge computing applications and capability, and to provide cost and efficient way when it comes to even addressing the sustainability agenda instead of driving the traffic all the way to a one centralized data center, have high processing fees and high processing energy bill, how we can uh, leverage the power of 6G, the low latency, the high capability from bandwidth point of view, and push the applications and platform near the end user and start really unleashing the value of the technology. This is definitely a transition. And uh, as Mark mentioned, we need to work collaboratively as an ecosystem of a player to look into this industrial convergence and how we can all work together to enable this for the benefit of the end customer, for the benefit of society, and really to bring the next level of AI, big data application, and automation to real practice. A thousand percent. Uh, Mohammed, so you now have seen Mark and Rashid talk about this. So about the preparation of 5G not being utilized yet. Because I agree there's a huge potential and still 6G is going to come regardless whether it has been utilized or not. What is the mobile network providers should be planning on strategizing their time, their efforts, their planning in making sure that one, 5G is fully utilized or at least 80% utilized uh, to its uh, potential that we have today and has been promised 10 years ago. And how are you preparing that transition to 6G as well? Because it's coming. Like in some countries, we're able to deploy 100% within a year because they're small. But then some countries are taking a little bit more time. Um, and the radius of the network is going to get smaller. Yes, yes. So how are you going to, how is that going to be planning and how is that going to be impacting the digital experience um, throughout whatever they have been uh, planning and building over 5G? Sure. First, let me reiterate exactly what Rashid and Mark said, because um, on the enterprise side first, so some statistics, 25% of the early adopters of 5G globally are from enterprise. So definitely to use the 5G to the highest scale, it can be only achieved in enterprise. Second thing I want to mention is exactly around the slicing that Mark mentioned, and network slicing. And again, this is a pure use case of enterprise and industry 4.0. And of course, all that, there is a lot, a lot to be done in order to maximize utilization of the 5G. 
and in order to be ready as an ecosystem for the 6G. Because, of course, all mobile service providers would love to have now a 6G that they can sell to all operators, but the ecosystem is not ready. So, yes, our R&D are working on it. They're working with the standardization team about how the 6G will look like. 100%, this is something ongoing. But there is a lot to be done now, a lot to be done now. A lot to be done on the industry 4.0, on the IoT, on the standardization, and how to make sure there is, again, something which is very important, which is not mentioned yet, is around universities as well. Yeah. Because if you have a partnership ecosystem, you can bring innovation to your platform through students, through Absolutely. universities. And all that will develop the use cases to the segments <laughs> that currently are not using the 5G. And of course, building on that, it will create the ecosystem which is going to be ready after that for the 6G. So, Mohammed and Isam, it falls upon you guys. Yes. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. Where, where is the <laughs> utilization of? <laughs> so, we, we have you know, those fears to try and fully maximize uh, uh, 5G technology and going through that digital transformation. And because there's more, every day you open something and you go like, okay, well, wow, this is great. And let's do that. So like, what are, what are our plans on accelerating and utilizing the 5G network? Because I completely agree, there's a lot of potential in enterprise, which is still untapped, it's still not captured. And we have the government, we've got uh, the, again, I've, to me, the priority would be Soho's government and then the rest of the place, because it's just the demand. Some governments are much more uh, digital uh, forward, like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, um, and some are mostly on developing the SMEs and the Soho's, for example, like Kuwait, like, okay, yeah. leave the government aside, we'll work on the small guys first. So what, what is, yeah. I think, I what think we the, can see? The key two points would, would touch very well and the first one was, was by, by, by Rashid, which is around the sustainability. Um, so in the, the key use case is really, if you think about what I used to always worry about when I was on the, you know, competing against the telcos, was they're connected into the building and they want to get inside the building, right? And me as a technology service provider, I want to stop them coming inside the building and starting to offer services. Um, telcos are very well positioned with, with 5G, with um, the ability to be able to manage the smart buildings and the services to get you know the the gains and and to go towards you know carbon neutral um, so that's a that's a great place to start and that's something that, that we work on with various clients uh, clients here um, so you know smart smart city sustainability that that's a key play for for the telcos with 5g by having sensors everywhere and be able to manage that and to provide you know business value because there has to be Yes, we all want to go green, but it's good to show that, that value, that commercial value of optimization, of reducing the cost, reducing the carbon footprint. Um, so there's a lot, lot we can do in that space. Um, the, the other point that I like that I actually missed off earlier is the, is the academia one, right? So where does innovation come from? So yes, we can all innovate and do the best we can, but if you look at the most innovative capabilities that come out, they come out from either startups or academia. Yeah. So it's, it's having that ecosystem is, is not just the traditional technology partners, which are fantastic, they bring the ecosystem, it's, it's academia, all these things. And these new innovations are the things that are gonna help us drive and accelerate the usage of, of, of 5G um, and, and you know, create a lot of value, new value, unique value for, for the telcos and for, for our clients. Hamad. Absolutely. <laughs> But, uh, sorry, I mean Tamer. <laughs> yeah, actually, if I, if I can comment also, in, in, uh, I would say if we look two years back, we were, I don't want to say nowhere, but it were very, very few limited use cases. Today, we witnessed really uh, huge progress in mining sector, in oil and gas, in uh, safe and smart city. So in, in defense application, in environmental application, especially with evolving of uh, Gen AI, it, it, we see today many real commercial use cases, even in, in, in the UAE, we are quite involved in, in many applications, especially for safe and smart city, oil and gas. And uh, as, as, as Rashid said, whenever MEC get evolved and we have more MEC infrastructure, it will, it will help because like one of the 
one of the like elements uh, 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 delaying this uh, strong evolution is the MEC infrastructure. It's not everywhere. So I, I see many cities are willing to go right away and evolve, uh, use 5G in, uh, for example, in city surveillance or in, in, uh, in major uh, smart city activity, but they are looking for who will do the MEC investment. Is it gonna come from the telco service provider or from the city or from the data center suppliers or, so TCO still, still also uh, one of the challenges. But uh, to be fair, if we compare today to two years back, it's, it's much evolved. It's, uh, uh, and honestly, who, who, whoever will start early, like for example now, 6, 6G, yes. If we start today, talk about like, do we have use cases? Not yet. But uh, if we keep waiting up to we get the use cases ready, we will be very late in adopting that. Also when 5G started, many voices was against 5G, yes. TCO, doesn't make sense what's the use case, but today it's, it's paying off. And, and we see many commercial enterprise deals in many aspects, even in the slicing part. Yes, it's not 100% mature, but we witness many uh, like uh, commercial surface of network slicing. And uh, even here in the UE with, with Etisalat and uh, Netcracker slicing management, we, we, we produce commercial slicing to our real customers and it work and it, it's not 100% cover every aspect of the network and uh, RAN, transport, poor, but we started, it work, and we have, we have uh, uh, commercial use cases. So uh, we didn't reach to uh, what we are willing to, but we are, we are, we are in the way. Yeah. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Now, Dr. Bilal, the last question for you would be is, as you have seen, like, you know, with technology, we're, we're always running, and we keep on running faster. Every time something comes new, we need to go even faster, just to catch up, just to, as you said, get that use cases, be adaptable. How are we keeping up with standardizing the policies for um, the new technologies that are coming up? Because it is very difficult. So what is something that is, you can give us an example that we can efficiently adapt to it? Sure, I'll uh, give you the example of um, a journey that we started in 2017 uh, when AI was still nascent and um, it just became possible to do artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, what we did in the ITU in 2017 is we convened a global summit on AI for good. We call it AI for good because we had 17 sustainable development goals that all of the UN is working on with the countries to achieve, but the achievement rate was quite slow. And we realized that AI uh, would be a great tool to accelerate achieving the sustainable development goals. So we called this platform AI for Good. We convened it in Geneva and we were very pleased to have 500 people come on board from all over the world who are experts on AI, from Berkeley and Stanford, the top universities, uh, also the companies that were starting to work, build AI solutions. And then that global summit grew the next year into 1,500, 2,000 people, then we had COVID, and we went on, uh, on, on a virtual platform, and now we have about 100,000 people online in our, what we call, neural network. This July, uh, last July, we convened the AI for Good Summit, 2,500 people came, because of, of course, ChatGPT just gave a lot of interest and uh, focus on AI. And uh, many of the discussions by governments, by the private sector, we had the CTO of Amazon, we had the CTO of Google and, and Cisco and, and Microsoft and Huawei and CTE. So many of the, the companies who are building solutions today uh, came around with governments to talk about how to keep pace and how to provide a governance framework for AI. So in a way, we're very glad that in 2017, we launched this AI for Good platform I would say the summit today is really the premier uh, platform for discussions on the applications of AI in the health sector. We're working with WHO on AI for health. Uh, in the um, agriculture sector, we're working with the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, another UN uh, sister organization on increasing crop production uh, using IoT and AI. Uh, with WMO and UNEP, uh, UN Environment Program, we're working on AI for natural disaster management. 
because you have a lot of satellite imagery, you have a lot of IoT devices, a uh, lot of sensors. If you can harvest that data, you could actually predict some of the yes. natural disasters. And when they do happen, through dissemination, communication, early warning systems, you can manage the crisis in a much more advanced way. And we see machine learning models in all of these cases for diagnosis uh, in the health sector, for uh, better crop, crop production and better irrigation systems in the agriculture, um, natural disaster management, I mentioned. Of course, uh, uh, smart sustainable cities is another great source of data. And if the city managers have that data uh, at their disposal, they can manage it in a much better way from road safety to um, management of waste, including e-waste and so on. So um, to your question on how to keep up with this technology, we're trying to play our role to convene the member states, the governments, uh, our 900 private sector entities, companies, all of the companies in the ecosystem are, and of course, academia. And I joined your point earlier, actually, the ITU saw in 2010 in our plenipotentiary conference that we needed to include academia as members of the ITU. So mm -hmm. today we have 165 academia research institutes That's who amazing. are members of the ITU. They actually come and attend our meetings. They have access to all the documents, which allows us to That's a great tap idea. into their intellectual property, their research. Yeah. And they can um, network with companies and understand their problems and so on. And then they go back to their university research and gu guide it on topics of interest. Um, on a yearly basis, we have a conference we call Kaleidoscope. It's a three-day academic conference, peer-reviewed papers, where we try to embrace the researchers around the world to work on topics for the future standardization. We also now have an ITU journal that is peer-reviewed, regularly published, uh, and indexed. So the academia now like it because, you know, professors, they get their <coughs> tenures through that. So I think through <coughs> this continuous dialogue in, on an international platform level, um, regulators can keep up with the technology because they get the awareness of what's coming and how it's impacting them. And we try in the ITU to develop these guidelines, these procedures, these model regulations. So you know, if you have a model regulation, you can take it and then adapt it a bit to your country and, and move fast. So those are some of the tools and techniques that we have in place. This week, for example, at COP28, before no one talks about digital as an enabler to sustainability, because the negotiators that go to COP sessions are usually the environment ministers. They're not the ICT ministers. Uh, by bringing this uh, digital action track to COP28 over 10 days, we have a number of sessions where the ITU is partnering with the ecosystem, the, all the companies in the digital space, to explain the value uh, of what I think Nokia calls the handprint, yep. you know, the 10% factor of how digital can help the other sectors mitigate their uh, CO2 footprint. Um, and so I think those are some of the examples on how we can keep up as a community, international community, with the evolving technology that's rapidly moving uh, to put the enabling environment and, and increase the awareness of the opportunities and threats. Dr. Bilal, I think uh, you folks in the community, that's an actually, uh, you're absolutely spot on. Bring in uh, uh, students to think about it. That's a, a brilliant, brilliant idea. I think more companies should adapt to that idea because they do have ideas. They do, you know, they complain, yeah. yes. but they will tell you, why not going in this X, Y, and Z? And usually we get to see in companies that people that we hire, the new hires, they would come in with a lot of ideas on changes that they want to do, and they actually have more simpler ways on attacking a problem. Because we are wired to see something differently, and they are rewired to, do so, to see something in a completely different view. I want to give you a concrete example, if I may, on uh, machine learning for 5G. So in the past, when we develop a standard, once it's done, we publish it in PDF form on the web. And then companies download it and implement it. In the case of machine learning for 5G, we wanted to go beyond the paper standard, and we created challenges, 5G machine learning challenges, and where we go with Do, for example, and Etisalet, and say, give us a few of the problem statements that you want to solve through AI and machine learning. And, and they did. Actually, Do is an active participant uh, in, in this space. 
we put those problem statements and then we go to the open source community and say, here is the standard from ITU, here are problem statements from companies, and we're gonna run a challenge for six to nine months, and those who develop software to solve it, the best will get an award, monetary, of course, an award, and, and then uh, in one of the uh, ITU events, we reward the, the winners. And that created an amazing community of software developers around the world working on real problems, and most of them come from academia. Now we have about five to 10,000 developers Mashallah. that join the ITU and the ecosystem, the companies, operators, and vendors to implement in an open source environment many of the standards in the ITU. That's really great. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. I was just like wondering if you guys have any last words. Mark, maybe we should start with you. Just thank you very much to the Telecom Review team, to Tony and the group every year. It's very exciting to come back, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark Rashid. Thank you again for the organizer, and this is like a great forum to really have all the industries together, and we are looking forward for future participation. Actually. Absolutely, Dr. Bilal. Yes, always coming here is two for one. We have the <laughs> CXO meeting the day before the, the Telecom Review Summit, where we have uh, uh, hosted by Tony and some of the, uh, the co-hosts an excellent opportunity to discuss with executives from the industry on the future standardization needs. And of course, the two days of telecom review is always Akid. an excellent sharing opportunity. Absolutely. So thanks, Tony. Samer. So of course, thanks to Tony and all telecom review uh, team. It's really, it impresses us with the quality of participant, quality of content. So uh, we waited, or where he, Tony promised us like uh, something big next year, so we are Waiting for that. I want to see it, Tony. That, don't forget me. <laughs> Isam? Thank you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. It's always good to, to share and learn. So thank you. Thank you all. No, just to thank you and thanks, Tony. It was a great day and looking forward to, for tomorrow as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time. And thank you, Tony. Thank you, Telecom Review, for this great. Anna? <laughs> really? <laughs> thank you so much.